Hey guys, what's up? It's me, the Gaming Spinosaurus, and oh my god, I saw Morbius last night. Midnight showing, because no one was booking tickets. I got home at 4am this morning. I am running purely on caffeine, and oh, I gotta talk about Morbius, man. So, let's just get right into it. Let's not beat around the bush. I have been hating on Morbius since ever since it was announced. A movie where Jared fucking Leto is the main character as an F-list supervillain. Which is supposed to be an expansion of the Sony universe. It sounds like a terrible idea. It's exactly what went wrong with The Amazing Spider-Man 2. You know, where they tried to start a universe by cramming so much things in and it just did not work at all. But oh my god, I was wrong. I was wrong. This movie is so good. So incredibly good. Unironically, genuinely awesome. Before I get into this uh, review in the movie, I just want to warn you, it is slightly insane. Honestly, if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes last night, um, I wouldn't believe anything said. So keep an open mind. Firstly, let's talk about the acting. Jared Leto manages to pull off his first ever good acting performance. He really sells the character of Morbius. His inner struggle as to whether he's a good or a bad guy seems very generic and surface level. Well, at least that's what the trailers have portrayed to us. But it's one of the most nuanced and engaging superhero character conflicts I've ever seen. However, I do wish they gave some of the side characters more screen time, such as James Corden's character, The Human Fly, and Shaquille O'Neal's character, Grizzly. I really enjoyed both these characters but they were given nowhere near as much character development and screen time as they needed. Because, but the actors completely carry it. James Corden does a fantastic job and Shaquille O'Neal is in this movie. Shaquille O'Neal! It's such a weird idea, but it works, man! If a few of the Michael Morbius scenes were cut, as some of them seems redundant, because a lot of the things they're portraying through dialogue, Jared Leto portrays through his fantastic acting, if those redundant scenes were replaced with character development for the side characters, they could easily have two extra Marvel Legends on their hands. But as it stands, Grizzly and the Human Fly were so much fun to watch, as Corden and O'Neill are clearly having fun in the role. The plot in this movie is absolutely jaw-dropping. It grips you from the start, as you jump right in to Dr. Michael Morbius doing a circumcision. And of course, he is a doctor, he's a surgeon. This is actually so meaningful as Morbius is shown to be a devout cack flick throughout the entire film. Yet he still helps out other religions, you know, he's a nice guy at heart. He then flies to a remote and desolate area, Smethwick, Birmingham, as there is a potential cure for his disease there. Then of course he gets bitten by a radioactive bat and given the powers of a vampire. And that's where the real fun begins. The entire of this movie's plot hinges on hunting the world for a device that will help you cure any disease, such as, and these are examples directly from the movie, blindness, cancer, being French, um, but yeah, it's kind of like a hunt for the MacGuffin, which normally would be boring, like in Rise of Skywalker, but the movie makes it so interesting, because everywhere you go, you meet new characters, there's some cool action set pieces, and it everywhere you go also feels fleshed out. It seems really generic at surface level, but they do so much with it. This is where our villain, played by the brilliant Jacob Batalon, comes in. Because he wants to destroy the device, so his son, played by Michael Keaton, and his ex-wife, played by Greta Thunberg, will die of cancer, as he's just not that fond of them, to be honest. This is one of the greatest plots of all time, as it's so gripping and it hooks you immediately. It allows, your, it allows the characters to grow and develop, but it also has so many twists and turns, you will not see what's coming. The music in this is on another level. Marshall Mathers composes the film's main theme, titled Morbius. It is an absolute banger. Nine minutes of pure fire, all achieved by only singing the word Morbius. Makes Venom look like a terrible song. Then there's the action music, which of course is Taylor Swift. It fits with the tone of the brutal and visceral fighting, which, by the way, is choreographed beautifully. I love how they don't hold back. I mean, Morbius literally uses two children as a pair of nunchucks in order to kill Airbud. The Taylor Swift upbeat music vibes really gel well with the horrific murders being carried out by our protagonist. And I mean horrifically brutal murders. And leads to some absolutely unforgettable action scenes. 
The movie also has some unique and interesting action set pieces. For example, the first big fight with Corn of the Coblin, the real villain, after he's been revealed and backstabs our protagonists, where he murders Topher Grace's Venom by stabbing him through the chest with a corn on the cob while they are riding on the train to Birmingham. Oh my god, it's so emotional as Jacob Battleon reveals that he, he is corn on the coblin and he stabs Topher Grace's Venom. Oh man, I'm, I'm tearing up just thinking about it. This leads to an incredible action scene where loads of our heroes get killed and some of the villains as well, including Carnage. The Joker, Thanos, Jared, Vulture, and of course Darth Maul. Another one of my favourite action scenes is in Stark Tower, the final confrontation, the final one-on-one -on -one fight between Morbius and Corn on the Coblin over the cure for all the diseases. It's so emotional as Corn on the Coblin has killed Topher Grace's Venom, Jared, and Vulture, and is also standing in Morbius's way of curing everyone. So this is so personal for Morbius, and it's really personal for Corn on the Coblin as well, as he wants to stop Morbius from saving his ex-wife and son, because he's just not that fond of them, to be honest. And as this personal conflict is happening, the song Blank Space by Taylor Swift is playing, and Stark Tower is slowly collapsing, leading to an epic front and confrontation that is one of the greatest I've ever seen. However, some criticisms of the movie are floating around that I would like to rebuke here, as I don't think they're valid in any sense of the word. Firstly, one of the big complaints is the movie's five-hour runtime. While five hours seems like a ludicrous length for a movie, the film completely justifies its runtime, as it's basically two movies sandwiched into one, plus a 30-minute intermission at the two-hour 30 mark, which really helps as it allows you to go to the toilet, and more importantly, lets you mull over the incredibly profound cliffhanger ending part one leaves you on without disrupting the flow of the movie i feel without that intermission like you wouldn't be able to really understand the ending um of part one i think another huge controversial part of the movie is the 10 minute hardcore sex scene this occurs in part two of the movie after the death of topher grace's venom where our characters are at their lowest emotionally as venom held the key to finding the cure for everything and corner the coblin now has that device that will let him find the cure this is when the human fly and Gwen Stacy's clone, played by Viola Davis, have an intense sex scene to the soundtrack of Pro Cycling Manager 2007. It really helps us learn about the two characters so much and furthers their development more than any conversation could. For example, we learn that the human fly's parents were killed by the toad, which is why he became the human fly, because toads and flies are mortal enemies. Overall, I think this scene is integral to the movie's plot and character development and cutting it would leave a hole in the film that could not be filled. The final and biggest complaint against this movie is how at the end, after they kill very brutally the main villain of Corn of the Coblin, and while his yellow blood still stains all of the characters, even the ones who weren't fighting Corn of the Coblin, Morbius kills them so brutally and so viscerally that the blood sprays everywhere on everything on like a 10 mile radius. You didn't even realise someone could have this much blood. There is a 20 minute dance scene to the song We Are Family immediately after this murder. Some critics believe this is tonal whiplash, but these people are wrong and just stupid. It's clearly a commentary on how society makes us hide our true feelings using the impressive tyranny of capitalism. And so by dancing to this brutal murder, it's showing how society is fixed and everyone can be themselves. I mean, come on, you're supposed to be critics. Overall, this is the greatest movie of all time. 10 out of 10. No, 11 out of... 12 out of 10. Like, the out of 10 scale doesn't even work here. You will never see anything as great as this movie. No movie will ever come even close to this movie's greatness. It's got incredible acting, a gripping plot, beautiful music, jaw-dropping cinematography, and most importantly, awesome characters. I can't wait for Morbius 2, Vampire Boogaloo, as is teased in the post credit scene where Fortnite Morbius jumps through a portal created by the Among Us crewmates and says, what am I? Some kind of Dr. Michael Morbius, which is of course a reference to the movie Suicide Squad 2016, where Will Smith says, what am I? What are we? Some kind of Suicide Squad. A deep cut as Jared Leto actually played the Joker in that film. But then immediately after Dr. Michael Morbius, Fortnite Dr. Michael Morbius specifically jumps through the portal to meet Sony vs. Michael Morbius, Optimus Prime jumps through and says his iconic line, give me your face. That's going to be it 
for this video, this review of Morbius. If you liked it, please do smash like. Subscribe for more content. If you do subscribe, be sure to hit the bell icon to be notified whenever I upload. I've been the Gaming Spine Source. You guys have been awesome, and I'll see you in the next video. Happy April 1st!